Hi, so my name's Matt and I'm from Queen Mary in London, uh, but I'm not the person that did this work. All right, this is Claire Kelleher and Sharif Clinch and they're the people who can claim all the credit for doing this. I'm only standing up here because unfortunately they couldn't be here and I happen to be in town anyway, so I get to stand here and tell you about it, but I'm not trying to claim any credit. Please gaze on their faces and admire them because they, they did all this and they deserve the credit for it. So the research question that we've got is really very, very similar to what Sophia was telling you about, about 15 minutes ago, I guess. We're using slightly different methods and a slightly different data set, but we've really got the same question in mind and we're trying to pursue it in very much the same way. So I'm very, very glad to see her here talking about that too. We're not brain scientists, we're computational linguists in our lab. So what we do is, so we work on a range of different things, but they all sort of center around using machine learning and statistical modeling to look at the language that people use. Uh, more often than not, when they're interacting with other people. And then try and see what we can tell from that uh, about who they are or about what they're talking about or about other facets of them or their personality or their actions. Um, over the last few years, we've done quite a lot of work on projects that are around mental health. And so we've been looking at things like what people's language can tell them about their condition, about whether we might be able to help doctors diagnose their condition or whether we might be able to help tell what's going to happen to their condition later or further on in the future. And we've had projects looking at things like schizophrenia, where we've analysed conversations between doctors and patients with schizophrenia. And it turns out from some facets of, of the way they talk, you can predict, not very accurately, but better, as well as humans can, but by looking at the same kind of transcripts, uh, whether they're likely to stick with their treatment in the future or drop out uh, and be much more likely to be subject to, to relapses. Uh, we've also looked at depression and anxiety and looked at conversations between therapists and patients to see if we can help predict what's going to happen to them, whether they're going to recover at the end of their treatment or not. And again, it turns out that you can get some good predictive power from it, although obviously not 100% accurate. And the kinds of features that we tend to end up looking at are, are partly about what people talk about, like the, the actual topics of conversation, but more often than not, they're more about how people are, are doing that talking. So they might be about things like the emotional... Uh, the emotions involved with the conversation and the variability in those emotions and how they differ between people. Uh, but quite often they're things like the fine conversational structures that people use to try and maintain understanding between each other. We go to a lot of effort when we're talking to each other that generally we, we don't notice um, to, to try and make sure that we understand what the other person we're talking to is saying and to try and make sure that that other person is understanding what we're saying. Uh, and we, we do this all the time. Um, you, you, often we're doing it without noticing, but we're trying to, from as basic a level as maintaining eye contact with people, to saying things like, mm-hmm, mm-hmm, at appropriate places uh, during the conversation to make sure that they know we're still following them. And without those strategies, people find it very, very difficult to talk to each other, actually. You probably experience that when you're talking on the phone and uh, you can't hear. Or you, you get a delay and the, 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 the signal from the other end. So we've often looked at things like whether people are clarifying each other's talk, whether they're going to a lot of effort to try and make it clear what they mean or to try and establish what the other person means. Uh, as in the kind of example that's probably too small for you to read on that slide, but you can come and look at it on our poster. Now, recently, what Sharif and Claire have been doing is trying to look at dementia and whether we can apply the same kinds of methods to see if we can help doctors diagnose whether people have early stage dementia. We are by no means the first people to, to try and take that kind of general view because it's probably fairly obvious that dementia is quite strongly associated with features of language um, and in all sorts of ways. So people's semantic memory is affected, so they're often much worse at trying to remember the names for things, which means they might stumble over words. It means they might use more simple ways of referring to things, using pronouns instead of nouns or names, for example. Their vocabulary often shrinks. They use less... They use simpler words to refer to, to things than rather than more complex ones. Uh, even th they might be worse at constructing complex grammatical sentences and use simpler sentence structures and so on. And people have done tests to try and establish a lot of these different features. The, one of the sorts of paradigms that people use a lot is to use tasks like getting them to look at pictures like this, very often this exact picture, which is called the Boston cookie theft picture. There's some kids trying to steal cookies from a jar, and there's all sorts of other things going on in the picture. Uh, and the task is that they ask a patient, please tell me everything that you can see going on in this picture, and then let them describe what's going on. 
uh, people have built very nice data collections of this. There's one called the Dementia Bank, uh, which has several hundred uh, transcripts of conversations between patients and investigators uh, describing this picture. Several hundred is big for this kind of study, I should point out. I know it's very small for lots of you in the kind of work you do. Uh, and there's been studies, including the one that Sophia mentioned uh, recently, uh, which has looked at a combination of lots and lots of these features and found that using those, you can get really quite good, impressive predictive power, uh, over 80% accuracy of trying to detect whether someone has dementia or not versus being in control. The thing, though, that's interesting for us, looking at almost all of those studies, is that the factors they're looking at are kind of very individualistic. They're about a person's ability to produce language. And as, we, as I was saying before, and as Sophia was saying, right, there's a lot of factors that are really more about the interaction between people that can be just as discriminative and just as informative in lots of cases. So what we wanted to do was looking at whether there are interactional features rather than individualistic features of language that we can look at. Now, there's lots of literature that suggests there should be, and a lot of it is driven by general sort of lack of coherence in dialogue. People get worse at knowing when is an appropriate time to respond, what's an appropriate way to respond, what's an appropriate way to indicate that you're ready for somebody to respond, and so on. And they might be just much worse at answering questions. And this can lead to all sorts of sort of observable features, like either not answering or saying, I don't know, or looking to the side to try and encourage someone else to jump in for you, or laughing to cover up your embarrassment and so on, as Sophia said. So these are the kind of features we've been trying to look at. We've built ourselves a model that extracts some basic indicators from the transcripts. This is, I think, probably one of the only two places where the work we're doing really differs from what Sophia is doing. We're not looking at the acoustics, sorry, we're looking at the actual words. Try to look at things that indicate lack of ability to respond, or one person's recognition that someone else isn't responding, added those into the model that people have done of individualistic language on this cookie description task. And we found that these interactional features are amongst the most predictive ones, things like the amount of time one person spends relative to the other and whether one's dominating the conversation, whether people are answering questions or not. And that if we add them in, it in improves the, the classification performance that we get. So what we'd like to do in the future is try and use some more natural data. So what I should point out about Sophia's study is it uses much more natural data than ours, uh, but it, although it's much smaller, and starting to see if we can combine some of our insights to do something even more interesting.